Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for coming back in. Uh, welcome to this plenary session, 20 years of micro-level analysis of violent conflicts. What next at this fantastic wider conference? My name is Tillman Brook. I'm the founder and director of ISDC, International Security and Development Center, an independent non-for-profit research center in Berlin, Germany, dedicated to the study of the conflict development nexus from an empirical and maybe not surprisingly micro-level perspective. I'm also one of the three co-founders and co-directors of the Households and Conflict Network. More on that later. Studying conflict from a micro-level perspective is not something that academia has always been doing. In fact, at the groundbreaking peace, Making Peace Work conference here at WIDA some 18 years ago, participants heard about 100 stimulating research papers on the drivers, forms, and effects of violent conflict and of peace. However, only four of those 100 papers addressed how individuals and households experienced violent conflict. Yet people are central to both conflict and peace. Just like the macroeconomy is made up of zillions of small decisions and transactions, world peace is constituted by the actions of billions of people, however powerful or powerless they may be. We therefore need to understand how the actions of people, both good and bad, drive the emergence of peace, how these actions shape the forms and dynamics of peace, and how peace, in turn, shapes the lives and livelihoods of people. Studying these drivers, forms, and impacts of peace and conflict is the mission of the Households and Conflict Network, which Patricia Justino, who is here with us in the first row, Philip Vervimp, and I established 18 years ago at the Making Peace Work Conference. What does the Households and Conflict Network do? We have a distinguished list of affiliates. Many of you are here in the room are affiliated with us, and those of you who aren't yet, please feel free to do so. Um, and they come from around the world and from many disciplines. We host a working paper series with nearly 400 papers published to date at our website, hicn.org. And we host annual workshops. In fact, the next, the 18th annual workshop, will be hosted by our wonderful colleague, Azu Kibris, at the University of Warwick in the UK on the 23rd and 24th of November 2022. The theme will be exposure to political violence and individual behavior, highlighting the importance of multidisciplinary, micro-level research on peace and conflict. The call for papers is now open, and we look forward to receiving submissions until the 31st of July, also from all of you here in the audience today. As it turns out, the organizer of the Making Peace Work Conference and the four presenters on these four micro-level uh, papers at that conference are here with us today to help reflect on what we have achieved and what is next in conflict and peace in general and in the micro-level analysis in particular. It is therefore my pleasure to welcome a series of distinguished guests to this panel. And now this is where the plot thickens. First, Tony Addison, on my far right here on the panel, is a professor of economics at the University of Copenhagen. He was chief economist and deputy director of UNIWIDA here in Helsinki, um, and of course the host of the 2004 Making Peace Work um, conference. Next in line on my right, we have Stathis Kalaivas, who is Gladstone professor of government and fellow of All Souls College at the University of Oxford. He was previously a professor of political science at Yale University, where he funded, founded and directed the program on order, conflict, and violence. And he and his program in Yale have been good friend and partner of the Households in Conflict Network. Next on my panel, we have Ana Maria Ibanez, who is a professor at the School of Economics at the University de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, and currently on leave, working as the economics principal advisor at the Inter-American Development Bank. She's also one of the gang of four I mentioned earlier, presenting a micro-level analysis on the impacts of conflict at the 2004 conference. And another good friend and partner and former host of one of our annual workshops of the Households and Conflict Network. 
And last but not least, Philip Verwimp on my immediate right is a professor of development economics at the University Libre de Brussels and one of the fellow co-founders and co-directors of the Households and Conflict Network. And of course, we have here, as I said earlier, Patricia Justino, who is the third um, co-director and co-founder of HICN and who, apart from having organized this amazing conference, is a senior research fellow here at UNOWIDA and on leave as professorial fellow from the Institute of Development Studies in the UK. Now, I've invited our four panelists to reflect a little bit on what we have achieved so far and where we are heading. And I'd like to ask each of them in turn to share their observations. That will make up uh, about the first hour um, of our panel. After that, we'll have some discussion here among ourselves on the panel, and finally, we'll also have some questions from you um, in the audience to discuss. So I'd like to invite Tony first to share some of his thoughts, please. Thank you. Good. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Tillman. It's great to be here and to see um, both old friends and, and also to make new friends, and that's very much what wider conferences are about. And, you know, we're very pleased at WIDA that we played a, a small role in helping to nurture the Hicken Group, which has grown very successfully over now nearly um, two decades. So, so the, I suppose the first observation I, I'd make is I sort of reflected back on this, and, you know, Tillman mentioned this in, the, um, in his presentation. Uh, we didn't actually have a lot on the microeconomics of conflict at the conference 18 years ago. And in some ways, um, the study of conflict in economics has almost paralleled the way development economics as a subject has actually um, grown over the years. So in the sense that 20 years ago, you know, we were making quite bold statements about the relationship of conflict to growth, to poverty, to inequality, to natural resources, uh, and about the impact of conflict upon those. Um, and those were useful statements, but, the, but those bold statements, we didn't really have it much in the way of, of, of evidence, at least at the microeconomic level. You know, we had some very useful um, cross-country regressions and, and so forth, but the, the sort of micro foundations were lacking. And in some ways, that's kind of a parallel of the experience of development economics, you know, from the 1950s to the to today that, you know, we had for a long time very bold statements about the relationship between variables. You think of the Kuznets curve, inequality and growth and so forth. But eventually sort of starting in the 80s and very much accelerating into the 90s, we got the creation of the micro foundations of development. So uh, Hicken has, has done a really fine job in, in uh, building a more robust uh, micro evidence uh, base in, in all of its... Uh, it dimensions not only the causes of conflict, but also very much the uh, evidence and the topic of this uh, conference, uh, building um, peace. And of course, um, I reflect on this because um, I, I got into an interest in working on conflict some um, over 30 years ago. I was in Mozambique during the transition from uh, war to peace in the early 90s, and I was working with the um, poverty Alleviation Group in the Ministry of uh, Finance in Mozambique. And we were working on the first post-war post um, poverty reduction strategy. So we were trying to frame out how we could work or we could move from uh, humanitarian assistance through the war to transition phase where refugees were being resettled and then, you know, building poverty into the longer-term development strategy for Mozambique. And the thing that uh, really struck me reflecting back on that was we, we actually had so little evidence, um, both at the macro level but also particularly at the microeconomic level, about how conflict in Mozambique had affected people, how they were being affected by the war to peace transition, and really what their prospects were in the post-war recovery, particularly the loss of assets, of land, of human capital and so on, you know, which would lead to a very poor recovery for many of the chronically poor people in Mozambique. So, so, so the importance of, of microeconomic evidence, both you know, data, but also um, causation, causal studies, and the integration of quantitative and qualitative evidence. You know, when, when people say to me, well, economics, you know, what does it bring to it? Isn't it about, we, we, you know, we're trying to stop conflicts, trying to stop war. Well, yes, we are, but we really need that kind of information or analytical base 
to move ourselves through the humanitarian phase, through the war transition phase, and into the reconstruction and recovery phase, taking the poor with us, because often, as we know from our own analysis, economies can grow quite strongly after conflict, but the poor are very much left behind. So the work of groups like Hicken and others is very vital um, to that. And, you know, at the, the time, I remember um, we sat around one afternoon in the poverty group in, in a very hot afternoon in Mozambique. <clears throat> and, so, you know, the question was being posed to us, what is the national poverty rate for Mozambique? We didn't know. You know, there was no national household survey. There were at least two million refugees, IDPs, th flowing around. We didn't have much in the way of national accounts data. Um, so, you know, we, we basically just came up with a number out of somewhere up, up there in the thin air. Two months later, I was in Washington at World Bank meeting, turned on CNN TV channel, and there was our poverty number being quoted. You know, X percent of people are now poor in Mozambique. So, you know, we're in a much better situation than we were uh, around about that time. And of course, that's tremendously important, not just for the design of economic policy and the design of economic recovery, but it's also very important to the prosecution of the perpetrators of conflict, because we know as a group that conflict is not just about maiming and killing people, it's about leaving people hungry and distressed and ill-healthy and so forth and so on. Effects that you know, live through the, the generations. And it also strikes me that... Um, in some ways, the microeconomics of conflict and the work of Hicken and other groups, we're doing a very important job in, in writing the history of late 20th century and early 21st century conflict and war. Because, you know, if you think back to the history of conflict, we, do, we don't really know, you know, much about, at least I don't, about, say, the impact of um, the First World War, to take one example, on households, on people. You know, we, we have some fragmentary evidence. You know, we, we, we rely on poets and novelists, people writing in the 1920s to tell us these stories. I have family stories about the impact of the First World War on my family. But, you know, I, I don't really know how much impact it did have at the household level. So, in some ways, the, the work that we're doing it's very important, and it's helping future historians write what has been a terrible history of the late 20th century, and now a terrible history of the first 20 years of the 21st century. And that's, again, very important as current and future generations try and learn lessons about stopping conflict, helping people during war, helping people in the war transition, and helping people in recovery. So, you know, that's another further reflection on the work of, of Hicken and others. I have many more points that I can make, but I think I'd like to just sort of cease my introductory remarks on that sort of historical point of view. Thank you, Tuma. Thank you very much, Tony. And of course, uh, your work on Mozambique resonates very much. I think that's how we met originally in the 90s when I was doing my doctoral research on Mozambique, and I was trying to to estimate, in fact, just for one province up in the north, Nampula, how many people were poor at that time based on this sample of data that uh, some people in the Ministry of Agriculture had collected. And, and I scratched my hat and I looked at the numbers again and again and again, but actually it turned out they were all poor. Yeah? All members of that household were below the official poverty threshold. Yeah? That's how devastated the economy in that part of the country was. And maybe that does tell a narrative of why we still see violence, or why we again see violence in northern Mozambique today. Yeah, the, the people were left behind from where they were, unfortunately, and they were very much beyond markets to some extent, and they weren't part of the economy, and uh, the, the, the little education they had made le very little, if any, difference to their livelihoods at the time, and I, I fear some of it is still like that today. So Yeah, I mean, those patterns of behavior have been perpetuated through time, and to a degree, the conflict in Cabo de Gaudo we see is, is a continuation of these themes, the continuing tensions between Renamo and Frelimo. You know, many of us at the time working on the, the design of the poverty alleviation strategy were very concerned, for example, about lack of access to land, natural resources, which have been a continuing source of conflict for the last um, 30 years. 
So, you know, again, this stuff resonates down through time. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. I'd like to invite Stasis to share his thoughts next. Thank you. Uh, so, Tony's uh, remarks about Mozambique uh, brought to me um, a thought that I uh, had uh, put aside. Um, one of the questions that um, Tillman asked us to reflect on uh, had to do with uh, books and, and works that were influential. Um, and it's very difficult to remember exposed uh, how your thoughts um, and your ideas were shaped when you began a project, especially when that goes back in time. So in the late 90s, when I started working uh, on the questions of uh, the dynamics, the microdynamics of violence, which at the time uh, uh, was a, um, a very um, uh, difficult to explain project, both because uh, political scientists did not work on microdynamics, they worked exclusively uh, on uh, the cross-national level, but also because the question of violence was not distinct from the question of war. Political scientists, especially security specialists, uh, tended to, uh, to define war as collective violence and therefore couldn't see uh, the difference between the two concepts. So one of the books that really shaped my thinking in those uh, early years, which I, um, I then forgot but remembered again now, was a book on Mozambique. And it was a book by a French anthropologist named Christian Geoffrey called uh, uh, La Cause des Armes en Mozambique, which described, in fact, uh, in, in extremely, um, I would say, um, in an extremely credible and, and fascinating way, uh, how a movement, uh, an armed group, the Renamo, which up to that point, everything I had read about described as a, as a group of crazy, people who uh, were committing gratuitous violence without any kind of logic actually operated. So it was not really uh, a book that um, emphasized you know, the collection of data uh, in a systematic way, but provided a very uh, insightful and a very compelling account of how a specific armed group came to connect with the civilian population. Uh, and part of that connection had to do with um, it, you know, the understanding that people had of politics at the time, especially uh, the longer term, the longer impact of the process uh, and the policy of the legislation that the Frelimo uh, government had, had, had imposed on Mozambique, which uh, by destroying pre-existing ties created an opening uh, for people to um, uh, support uh, in some, in some uh, way uh, this movement. So a movement that was described at the time as being completely uh, foreign-based, gratuitous in its violence, devoid of any politics. In fact, it turned out through this account, uh, had there was a much richer and, and interesting story. And it was part of those readings that eventually led me uh, to shift my project at the time from um, a political sociology uh, of allegiances, understanding how people pick sides, uh, to a project in which I wanted to, in a sense, reverse the question to understand how violence was used uh, in a way that eventually uh, created long-term loyalties or shifted people's loyalties. So, uh, in reflecting uh, on this work on violence, um, I returned recently to a recent um, uh, review paper uh, that uh, was authored by Laia Balsells and Jessica Stanton that reviews 20 years' worth of research on violence. Um, and um, I sort of came out of reading this piece with two thoughts. The first one, I was incredibly impressed by the amount of research that has been conducted on this topic uh, in, two, in, in 20 years. There's been a proliferation of papers, of research projects. Uh, people have done an incredible amount of research on that topic. We know much more than we used to know uh, 20 years ago. So there is definite, definitely a sense of progress. At the same time, when I finished reading this paper, I felt even more confused about a topic that I know quite a lot about. Uh, so the proliferation of, of research is also producing a proliferation of findings. There is a proliferation of dependent variables. People study not, so, not just you know, the, the, the level of violence that's exercised, but also the forms. Uh, the repertoires of violence, the combination of forms of violence and armed actors that use them in a variety of different places using uh, data that is not necessarily comparable, concepts that are not necessarily comparable. So we have, in a sense, to deal with a, an enormous amount of information and it's very difficult to make sense of that information. Uh, another thing that I thought was that uh, we are, uh, in the past, the absence of data uh, what Tony described in, in, uh, in a very sort of compelling way 
forced us to, to be more creative, both in how we studied what we studied, but also in terms of theorizing uh, the process that we were interested in. Uh, and I have the feeling now that uh, the uh, facility with which we can collect data has led to a, a sort of relative atrophy of the theoretical muscles, if you want, of our brains. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, think about uh, how we model theoretically violence. Uh, one very simple way is to think there are two sides and they fight against each other. This is an understanding uh, of the dynamics of violence that's very much uh, reflective of the uh, dynamics uh, of interstate war, in which you have two states fighting against each other. Uh, but it turns out, especially, uh, it's, it's not a very good representation of interstate war, it's even less of, of, of a civil conflict. Why? Because uh, the connection between armed groups and uh, civilian and local populations is much more critical. And the need to understand that kind of uh, interface uh, matters very much. So in a sense, that complicates the theoretical modeling because it's not enough to study the clash between two groups. You also have to understand how those groups um, interact with the underlying populations. On top of it, you don't just have two groups. It's not just the state against another group. Very often, the state devolves a lot of authority to other actors. So uh, one of the characteristics of, of civil conflicts is the fragmentation of monopoly of power sometimes in a willing way. So you have a variety of militias, but also you have a variety of rebel groups as well. And sometimes you have very violent, uh, in a sense, wars within the war between competing rebel groups. So that complicates the process even more. Then, of course, the civilians are not a unified kind of population. Even a village is divided. People uh, have different loyalties, different interests. There may be class, ethnic, or even political divides. Those divides can harden or can get reshuffled and transformed through the process of, of conflict. So you have a very dynamic model that, in a sense, um, uh, is uh, producing uh, some of the data that we strive to interpret. And it's going to be very difficult, I think, to make sense uh, of the data we collect, and we're going to collect at increasing uh, levels using you know, new techniques. Uh, and so I think it's very important to um, invest very much in, in the theorizing. So how can we do that? A couple of thoughts about that. One way is to understand the dynamics of conflict much better, which in part uh, is the outcome of theorizing conflict better. But I think we have to also connect the microdynamics to two other levels uh, which uh, have existed. One level is the macro uh, study of conflict, uh, which it has existed independently for a long time. Another uh, level is the meso dynamics of conflict. So on the meso level, we've had very interesting research recently. What is the meso level? Understanding the groups. Uh, and there are two dimensions to groups. One is the connection between the group and the population that I just mentioned, but there is another one which has to do with the internal dynamics of the group. What is, you know, how is the command and control uh, of a group organized? How is the sort of administration of that group uh, set up, how do groups recruit people, how do they train them, how do they incorporate them inside, how those groups then fragment, reconnect, coalesce, etc. The processes of defection between groups and between groups and the state, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is also a very lively uh, area of investigation, which is very often described and called rebel governance, which has to do with how uh, those groups then define and devise a set of policies which they uh, impose on local population, sometimes in ways that are coercive, but sometimes in ways that mix coercion uh, and other forms of association with locals. And then how those forms uh, of governance then uh, shape uh, and impact the behavior uh, of, of civilians. So that's the meso level. Uh, there is quite a lot of work that gets done, but that work also needs to be connected to the microdynamics. And finally, how can the macro level be brought back into the equation? Well, um, it turns out that systemic factors have a very big impact on both the populations, but also especially the groups. What is going to be the ideology, for example, the political identity of groups, is completely um, associated uh, with systemic factors. The fact, for example, that between roughly 1950 
1990, uh, a great proportion uh, of groups fighting civil wars across the world had a Marxist revolutionary socialist agenda and identity, uh, can only be explained by systemic factors by the Cold War. And so it's very difficult to say something meaningful if we ignore this kind of periodization. Very much the type of group and the type of dynamic that emerges in the post-Cold War period, very often also referred to as the liberal international order, which is very much the kind of period that still informs our thinking, especially in the policy realm. The idea, for example, uh, that our number one priority is to eliminate violence and war, uh, is to get the parties to a conflict to settle, is to have international interventions, is to invest in peacekeeping. That is very much, I think, a characteristic that dominates in the period that starts in the early 1990s, but comes gradually to an end, it seems, starting in the early 2000s. Why? Well, because uh, the September 11 attack and the uh, military uh, choices of the United States, especially in the, in the area of the Middle East, uh, unleash a new set of dynamics that seem to produce a new type of conflict uh, that uh, is not, for example, uh, easily amenable to peacekeeping, that has actors that have a revolutionary ideology that didn't exist in the previous period, and that also produces conflicts that very often do not terminate with a settlement. So understanding those systemic dynamics and even pushing them into the past, for example, there is a period roughly between uh, the beginning of the First World War and the end of the Second World War that's very much dominated by civil wars in Europe, the richest countries of the, of the era, uh, produce, in a sense, parameters that define a lot of what we observe uh, and we think very often is constant. So we need to be alert at that. So my general message, if, uh, and I'm going to stop here, is that uh, sometimes it pays uh, to try to absorb um, a lot of what is going on, step back, uh, and try to use different tools to try to better make sense uh, of the data that we collect. Thank you, Status. That's a very clear message, and I... It's um, encouraging to see that you also sometimes uh, find it overwhelming, all the evidence that gets put out there. Overwhelmed by our own success, I suppose, yeah, if I can put it like that. But trust economists to reduce it down to some very simplistic uh, <laughs> models, yeah? So we, we come to your rescue if, if you need us, yeah? Um, Anna Maria, can you come to our rescue, please? <laughs> yes, you have slides. Wonderful. Thank you. She works for the UN, she has slides, yeah? That's, uh... Thank you very much. Yes, so I am the only one with boring slides, yes. but <laughs> thank you, Patricia, Justino, and, and you knew wider for inviting me today. I'm really glad to be here. You organized a wonderful conference. And also congratulations to Tillman and thanks to Tillman, Philip, and, and Patricia for creating HICIN. It has been a great place for us to, to talk about a conflict and to help each other discuss our work and improve, improve our work. What I'm going to do is something somehow similar to what Statis this is to reflect on 20 years of, of research of forced migration, especially internal, internal displacement, through the lens of, uh, of an economist which who we sometimes tend to simplify too many uh, things too much. Uh, we economists have been studying migration for, for quite a long time, and we know that mm, migration really helps people improve their economic conditions to mitigate the impact of shocks and for several other reasons. And migration has been, have been really important, migration especially from rural to urban areas, for economic development, to transition from agricultural economies to more sophisticated economies. And what the, the um, research on the microeconomic impact of migration, not of forced migration, has found is that migration indeed is an effective strategy uh, of households to increase income, smooth consumption, and improve the welfare of migrants and their families. But during wars, migration is also important. And it's also a very important strategy, an effective strategy to survive amid a conflict. 
Uh, but in these cases, people are migrating to seek refuge and to protect their lives and not necessarily to improve uh, welfare conditions. In fact, uh, sometimes it's a trade-off between welfare and the improvement of security. So what I do today in the presentation is to take most of the Hicken papers that have been done on forced migration and do like a summary of what we have learned. Not everything because it's kind of overwhelming because we have a lot of papers on that. About 33% of the papers of, of Hicken are on forced migration uh, for these many countries that I'm showing there. So contributions of the economic literature uh, to understand migration in times of conflict uh, is fairly recent. I would say that only during the last 20 years despite the really rising trends that we have of forced migration. Today, in 2020, we had 73 million people that were forced to migrate from their countries or within their countries. Most of them were internally displaced persons, and this trend is intensifying as we speak, as uh, the UNHCR is, to, is now uh, estimates that about 4 million Ukrainians were forced to flee from Ukraine, and there is a lot of uh, forced migration within the country as well. This rising trend of forced migration is really related to an increase on the incidence of internal conflicts. Uh, and after the end of the Cold War, what we saw is that there was an increase of interstate conflicts uh, with respect, uh, compared to, to, to countries being fought between states. So during the last years, what we have seen is that the number of conflicts, interstate conflicts, have intensified. So during 2020, we had 56 conflicts from and compared from 1991 that were 51 conflicts. Uh, but maybe we're going to have an, uh, an important shift with the, the war in Ukraine, in Ukraine currently. And differently than conflict between states, and this is part of what Statis has studied, uh, in, in interstate wars, uh, where the combat lines are very clearly defined in interstate wars or wars fought inside the countries, these combat lines are not clearly defined. And what happens is that the population is highly victimized. Uh, in fact, a very important effort done by the Centro de Memoria Historica in Colombia to calculate the number of deaths during the conflict showed that 80% of the deaths in Colombia uh, during more than 30 years were uh, civilians and not combatants. This happens because armed groups attack the population to achieve war strategies. Some of them are uh, to expand territorial control, to alienate the civilian population against the opponent group, and to seize valuable assets and obtain valuable information, among others. Uh, and as I say, what we find is that, for example, in Colombia, 80% of the population, 80% of the deaths were civilians. What happened with economists, and that's why I don't think we are going, we will be very good to solve the puzzle, Tillman, I'm sorry, had ignored forced migration for several years. And most, mostly we concentrated in economic uh, migration and understanding economic migration. And the argument that economists gave, and this was published in the Handbook of Development Economics, so I'm not inventing this or interpreting it, is that migration was, forced migration was a political problem in which refugees and internally displaced persons and IDPs were passive victims of conflict and war with little room for voluntary decisions. And what the microeconomic analysis of conflict, especially political science has shown, um, and many of, of those are here in this room today, is that people and households do have agency. They adopt several strategies to survive amid violence and conflict and to interact with the armed groups. And migration is one of the strategies they adopt to minimize the impact of war and increase the chance of survival. So what I will concentrate today, and it's going to be short, don't worry, is that I'm going to discuss uh, the recent literature on forced migration, the one that was published in, in the Hicken website. And then I will address the economic consequences very quickly, uh, and I'm going to concentrate on asset losses and labor markets. So although households uh, are facing dire conditions uh, and violence might be extreme, households in conflict areas make decisions, as I said, and they really behave strategically. However, what we have found is that violence and conflict really dominate the decision to migrate. But traditional economic incentives do play a role as well. This is what the literature and economic analysis of conflict shows. There is little quantitative evidence on the relation between violence and, and migration, 
But the initial studies in the 90s shows that time series for Salvador and Guatemala, for example, show a strong correlation between migration and violence. And the recent mi microeconomic studies with household surveys show this is also the case. And what we find is really three regularities. As I said, violence is a strong correlate of the decision to migrate. And the second one is that Violence is deliberately targeted against the civilians. So although there is some indiscriminate violence as well, we have a lot of deliberate targeting. So migration is not, a random, is not random. Uh, armed groups are, are behaving strategically. The, the population is, is behaving strategically as well, and they are making decisions. So the people that migrate is a particular group of the population. The third regularity that we find is that traditional economic incentives also play a role. A lesser role, but they also play a role. On the one hand, we have traditional migration incentives that act as push and, and pull factors. Uh, so we have, for example, that the deterioration of economic conditions in conflict area, uh, presumably due to conflict, pushes some households to leave in spite of not being direct victims of conflict. But violence may also reverse the traditional role of economic incentives. And we find this, for example, for a paper in Indonesia uh, that was published a long time ago in, in the Hikin uh, website. So there are, for example, there are deliberate attacks to the better off population and they leave. But usually with traditional economic incentives uh, model, this is not happening. No? So it's reversing the role of these traditional economic in incentives. And what is important, uh, is that there is a redistribution of the population along the territory that is not random. It's a, it's a redistribution that depends on economic characteristics of the households, social economic characteristics of the households, and political characteristics as well. So after the conflict ends, what we have in the territory is that there was a non-random redistribution of the population, and this is going to determine the opportunities for economic development when we are in a post-conflict period. I am tempted to end it there. Yeah. You, you have time, that's fine. Yes? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the consequences uh, of violence uh, or of our conflict. There, the, there are many fault, uh, consequences. Most are negative, but there are also some positive consequences of forced migration. But what we see is that migration is, forced migration is oftentimes quite hasty. So households leave behind assets, mostly productive assets, when they arrive to the destination cities, they need to seek employment uh, without the, the usual social networks to do so, and they don't have much access to risk sharing mechanisms. So the settlement process is quite difficult, it takes a long time, and this may create poverty traps that are difficult to overcome. So as I say, I'm going to concentrate on asset losses and labor markets. Uh, and what, what the, the evidence shows is that during conflict time, asset losses, as I said, of productive asset losses are quite high. And one example is Mozambique, as Tony, as Tony said, but we find something similar in Rwanda and we find something similar in Colombia as well. This is caused by the hastiness of the migration, but also because of the lack of rule of law in these conflict uh, areas and the lack of protection of, of property rights, which really facilitates this illegal seizure of assets. But what is interesting is that asset restitution processes are also really an opportunity to redress these negative impacts of conflict and can become really an opportunity to, uh, to promote economic development once conflict ends. Uh, and what is important is that these initial drops in income that people face uh, initially are, are sometimes difficult to overcome because it's difficult to connect with labor markets and like to access labor markets because even though they migrate within the country, skills are not necessarily transferable, people don't have, they lose their network, so finding a job is more difficult, and labor markets are, in the first place, weak due to the conflict impact. However, and this is very important, on the positive side, forced migrants, since they perceive they are going to stay permanently, permanently uh, they invest more in the human capital of the region in where they are, so they are able to, after time passes by, uh, their, their conditions improve significantly. Lastly, what I think is important is that 
we also see a transmission of the impacts of forced migration on the locals through prices, housing and food prices, for example, and through wages. Just think about wages. There is a large outflow of population that arrives in the destinations, cities, for example. This is going to expand the labor supply. There is going to be more competition and wages are going to go down. The effect is going to depend on the profile of the migrants and is going to depend as well on the profiles of the people in the destination areas. But what's going to happen is that some part of the population are, is going to be uh, affected by this. And we find each time more convincing evidence that this is the case uh, in many countries. So just a brief summary of what I said and three broad conclusions based on, on the literature, that, as I said, that has been published in the Hicken website. We do find, uh, and this is very important, a, a very important uh, finding, and I think uh, for policy decisions as well, is that migration during conflict is not truly forced <laughs> nor truly voluntarily. Voluntary people in, in conflict regions have agency and they stra and behave strategically, and armed groups behave strategically as well. Although violence is a dominant factor, uh, economic uh, conditions also play a, an important role. And very importantly, my, uh, migration can be an effective strategy to avoid victimization and survive in conflict times. This migration, however, implies really a large trade-off between the economic conditions and the improvements in security. And lastly, what is important as well is that many of these effects transmit into the destination location through prices and wages and through other uh, general equilibrium effects. Thank you, Ana Maria. I think it's an excellent um, overview. <laughs> and I think your first point, you know, it's so obvious once one starts thinking about it that in times of conflict, you know, moving is not just an issue um, for economic reasons, it's not just an issue for security reasons, but it's a combined. And therefore we need a combined analysis, you know, accounting for both issues, and there may be others, you know, like social network, etc. yeah? But we need to have a combined analysis. On the one hand, policymakers find that so hard, right? I mean, all the debate in, for example, Europe is about, you know, either the poor war refugees who are only coming because of the war, or the economic migrants who are just trying to get into our social systems, yeah? And this idea that there are multiple um, drivers and, and, you know, push and pull factors, etc. you know, it's just too complex, it seems, for, for, for much of the political discourse, unfortunately, yeah? So from a policy perspective, we need the integration of these perspectives. But I think we do also need it from a sort of disciplinary research uh, perspective so that we do justice to the, to the questions in hand. And like Stas has said there, um, you know, there's a lot on the conflict side and the, you know, changing perspectives, etc. But, and, and the economists, for example, through the households in conflict we have been pushing and invading and colonizing these sort of political science fields. But I think we need it in the reverse direction just the same way, right? So we can't do good economics if we don't have, if we're not informed by the good uh, political science, yeah? So I think that's part of what we all like to practice, but which when we then battle with journal editors becomes sometimes very, very difficult, yeah? Thank you so much. Um, all right, Philip, uh, you also have some thoughts, and I think you're broadening this a little bit because I think you're going to talk about some social issues and intra-household issues and welfare issues, right? All right, let me first say that it's such a pleasure uh, to be at a large conference again and seeing old and new colleagues. After this dreadful two-year period of COVID, it's a real pleasure to be involved in intellectual stimulating debates uh, today and, and I'm sure also tomorrow. I'm really benefiting of it. I get an intellectual stimulus of, with talking uh, with many of you. Now, when I reflect upon 20 years of micro-level research uh, that we have done in the Households in Conflict Network, it's very difficult to make a choice because we have contributed on so many domains that it was really not easy to make a choice. But when I have to pick a few of them, I'd like to start with the distributional uh, consequences of exposure uh, to violent conflict. And what I mean with that is I would like to illustrate that on the Ukrainian-Russian uh, war that's going on at the moment. Imagine that you're a 35-year-old engineer uh, just before the conflict working in eastern Ukraine. The war occurs and you cannot uh, work anymore, you lose your job and you're drafted into the army, right? And maybe you can use your skills uh, as an engineer, 
but more importantly, you had your education behind you, and when the war is over, and, and you survive the war, hopefully, you can contribute to the reconstruction of your country because you have the human capital. Eh? You studied, you're at, at the prime age, you're 36, 37, and you're fully uh, educated to start reconstructing your, your country as an engineer. Contrast that with a person who is at the same place, 16, 17 year old, who he or she sees the school bond and cannot finish his or her education and is forced to flee uh, the country. That's a whole other perspective, and that's uh, the cohort perspective, the cohort uh, uh, perspective. Maybe for a few years, you're not able to finish your high school. And so when the war ends, you are maybe without a high school degree, and you cannot contribute uh, maybe to the reconstruction of your country. Maybe you want to finish uh, going to school before you can actually contribute to the country. So you lose a year, maybe two, maybe three years of education. And that's different from the engineer who is 35 years old. So you are more affected at 16, 17 than at 35. You're heavily affected in your human capital accumulation. Now, it can even go worse. Imagine that in the same eastern Ukraine, you are two years old. And your hospital uh, where your mother gives birth to a second child is bombed. And maybe you lose your father. Uh, you become half an orphan. We find in the Households in Conflict Network in many research <laughs> that this is heavily affecting your future <coughs> human capital accumulation, <coughs> excuse me, starting with nutritional deprivation. Yeah, so you will be uh, sick uh, for many months, you will not have enough food, you're traumatized as a baby, and this will heavily affect you not only in the next few months compared to the 16, 17-year-olds, but it will affect you throughout your life because as a young child, we know when you're affected as a very young child by violence, by trauma, you will be finding the consequences of that throughout your life in a less developed, anxious brain. Maybe you're stunted, uh, you will not reach the statue that you, that you have. And throughout our long-term research, we know that will have long-term implications on human capital accumulation, on the income that you will earn, and potentially also on the way you will raise your own child because you will be anxious. And so this is the one first distributional consequence of exposure to conflict is at the cohort level. Compare the 35-year-old with the 16-year-old, with the two-year-old, and you see how different they are affected by uh, the exposure to conflict. And it's one task, one skill of the economists also to point out to these distributional effects uh, of, of conflict. These same distributional effects can not only be found at the cohort level, but also at the gender level. Again, looking at the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, see how different men and women are affected by the conflict. Uh, the Ukrainian presidency does not allow able men to leave the country. They have to fight, they have drafted into the war, and they're sending their daughters, their wives, to other European countries for safety. So the wives, the daughters are in safety, they are going to school, maybe they learn German, they may learn Polish, they may learn Dutch, they may learn English, where their men are fighting the war. What does that mean for the years coming to the war? And they have completely different experience. The women are living in anxiety because of what's going to happen to their men, but at the same time, maybe they can advance their human capital accumulation. They can take care of their children while their brothers and their fathers are fighting against the Russians. And so the gender effect, again, a task of economists is to look at the distributional consequences of exposure to war. Yeah? Take again another distributional effect is at the Russian side. Uh, we know that thousands of Russian soldiers have died in Ukraine, but very few, almost none of them, come from the Moscow area. They all come from smaller regions at the outskirts of, uh, of, the, of the empire. They are Chechens, they are from Siberia, they are from ethnic minorities. Those guys are sent to the war to die, and none of them at the regional level around Moscow. Uh, again, a distributional consequences of war is who are you sending to the war? Are there the elite troops? No, they are the poor guys from the outskirts of the empire. Those are going to be fought in the war. Maybe that's one reason why Putin has still so much support for the war, because none of the people around the elite in Moscow suffers from the war. The suffering occurs by the regions outside of the empire. Okay? 
And so one can look at other types of uh, distributional effects, for example, along the poverty, non-poverty axis. Uh, in, in my work on, on Burundi and Rwanda, partly with, with Patricia Justino, we have looked at the distributional consequences of exposure to war. Who is losing land? Yeah? Who is losing assets? Are these the poor? Are these the non-poor? Uh, the same work has been done by, by in, in the Colombian case, where we find it's not only the poor who are affected by violent conflict. The non-poor can also lose their assets eh, because they're exposed. They maybe even have a specific profile that they make them very attractive to rebels, eh, stealing cattle, for example, eh, that to, to finance the, the war effort. So the distributional consequences of war along the poor, non-poor axis can be very important, can be also important in Ukraine. I don't have data on that, but definitely in the developing countries that we are studying, this is an important axis. And who is losing out of war? Who is winning from war? And I think it has been a contribution by many researchers in the Households in Conflict Network over the past 20 years to look at those distributional, conflict, uh, uh, distributional consequences. And this has large uh, consequences also for policy making. We know that when the war ends, 10, 15 years down the line, the country will most usually be at the uh, trend of macroeconomic growth that it used to have before the war. And that takes about 10, 15 years, exactly because many funds are being channeled through the country for reconstruction. So at the macroeconomic level, the country will be back on tracks about 10 years later. But that does not mean everything is okay in the country those people at young age who have lost out their parents, who can't go to school, who are very sick during the war, who maybe lost an arm or a leg, or who may be blind. Eh? Those people, they don't really care about this macroeconomic level. They know that their situation has been worsened for their entire lives. And so even when the country is back at its macroeconomic growth level, there are a lot of microeconomic traumas from the war who should be addressed by policy making, by a fine-tuned policy. For example, if you lose your parent, if you lose two parents, then maybe you can finance your studies because you know that nobody will be able to pay for your studies. And so we need to fine-tune policy specifically at these levels of distribution, these fine-grained levels, because people are differently affected by, by, by the war. And I think Part of the task of economists and also our skill is to show policymakers that it's not one, fight, one, one size fits all, but it really has very specific consequences depending on your age, depending on your court, depending on your gender, depending on the profession you had uh, before the war, depending on your welfare, you will be differently uh, affected by the war. And I think that's one thing we have been uh, doing uh, many, uh, for, for the last few years in, in, in the Hicken Network. When I want to mention something else is also, I think, especially during our working paper series and the annual conferences that we have, is to offer a platform to graduate students. I think that's one of the key things we have been doing for many, many years. It's like one half to three fourths of the, of the persons that come into our conference are PhD students who are given a platform for the first time to present their work to colleagues. And I think we have been benefiting so much from advancing, from stimulating, from supporting a new group, a new cohort of PhD researchers that work on these issues. And we welcome them because when we started the network, nobody was really working on these issues and we had to support one another. Now they can see that there are hundreds of researchers working on these issues and that stimulates them. They say, hey, we can work on that. And I always tell my graduate students, okay, here you can work on data, but when you do that, you also need to become a country expert. Right? Study the history of the conflict, study the anthropology, study the political economy, just don't look at data. Right? Go there, collect your data, become a country expert, and then do your economic analysis or your econometric analysis, and that makes you part of the country. You, as a researcher, become part of the history of the country, and you take a role as researcher, but maybe also as an advisor in the future. You're going to care for that country. And that's, I think, a, a very valuable role that I also want to mention to graduate students how important it is to become country experts and to engage in the country and not just do your econometric analysis. I think I will leave it there. Thank okay, you. excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. In fact, some of the nicest moments at our HICN um, workshops have been when graduate students start presenting and they pause on slide two and they say, 
no, to this audience, I don't have to explain why I can study conflict as an economist, yeah? And they forward and then they go into the actual analysis and then for the first time they're in a community where it's allowed to just unashamedly study um, these issues. Um, when you talk about um, the, all these heterogeneous impacts, um, I, I think one thing that is also important to bear in mind is that um, some conflicts um, even have impacts way beyond the location of where the fighting takes place. I mean, it could be um, in the neighboring countries, it could be in the countries that, like you said, in the Russian case, you know, the fighting at the moment is in Ukraine, but it could be all over Russia. Um, but in this case, it could even be all over the world economy through, you know, rising fuel prices, rising food prices, yeah? So the, the impacts of the conflict are often um, not necessarily global, but at least much more geographically widely spread and leading to uh, further um, inequalities um, in outcomes as a, as a result of the violence. And perhaps going one step further still is the interaction of the violence and, and violent conflict and the impacts of the violent conflict with other global challenges, like, for example, climate change. Yeah? And I think that's something that we in the field are increasingly noticing that in, in Syria, in um, the Sahel zone, in uh, Lake Chad area, in northeast Nigeria, you know, we see these climate change, conflict, interactions which reinforce each other in, and create really wicked problems, yet, which are really uh, they're hard to study, but they're also hard to solve. Yeah? So I think that's, um, that's also very important. Thank you so much. Um, we have heard a lot about what we have done in the last uh, 20 years, and that's fantastic. With the benefit of hindsight, some of it seems quite obvious, perhaps, you know, that these impacts are the way they are, that these topics are important. So I was wondering if any of you have any examples of counterintuitive findings that you have found in your reading or in your writing, or surprising findings, you know, things that maybe didn't go along with your political science or your econ uh, backgrounds at first sight. Children, I have one. Yes? A counterintuitive finding, which is also probably, I think, the most important counterintuitive finding that most people don't know. Uh, which needs to be advertised. And this is that in a context of conflict, the incidence of a violent event is not a good indicator of the level of conflict. This is a very big problem because a lot of studies use uh, uh, violent incidents as a measure uh, of how um, acute a conflict is in a particular area. And the reason this is not a good indicator is that within a conflict-ridden country, you may have areas that are, for example, controlled in full by a rebel organization or an armed group that are totally peaceful. Precisely because an armed group is able to establish a monopoly of violence means that those areas are going to be peaceful. So the fact that on aggregate you don't find violence in those places does not mean that the conflict has subsided or that, you know, the trend is going well. So that, I would say, is a sort of um, point that a lot of people tend to ignore, especially people who are not familiar with conflict but use data and then use uh, these indicators then to correlate uh, or to predict other variables as, as an incidence of conflict. I suppose the point is that the expectation of violence drives behavior and not, the real, not necessarily the realization of it. Right? So, at least some behaviors. Well, uh, certainly behaviors in places that are um, without uh, open violence, but the threat of violence is very much present. Yeah. Uh, that is going to shape, obviously, behavior. For example, decisions about migration mm -hmm. yeah. may not take place directly as a result of violence, but in terms of calculations about how things may change given the prevalence of a particular type of rule. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should be measuring the anticipation of violence or the expectation of violence rather than the occurrence. Well, I think one of the things we should be measuring that we're not measuring very well is territorial control in uh, situations of, uh, of uh, conflict. And the, the reason we're not measuring as much uh, is because it's very difficult to measure, much more yeah. difficult than incidents. So if you look at studies on Afghanistan or Iraq in which the United States was collecting and disseminating a lot of, uh, you know, the SIGACT data set, for example, uh, those were the ones that, are, that, were, that, that were used by researchers, whereas we didn't really have uh, easily available data about the level, the type, the kind of control that was exercised in a particular locality. Yeah, thank you. Anna Maria, you have another one. Yes, no, I have a follow-up to, to Stati's uh, intervention. Because when you measure 
violence and you try to measure the presence of armed groups or the control that the armed groups exert on the community or the rebel governance that the armed groups are able to, to implement in the community, the effects of conflict are very different. So for example, a paper that we wrote with Patricia and that we, we, we have been working for a while, what we find is that presence of armed groups, and we don't know what the presence is entailing, but the presence of armed groups is increasing participation in community organizations, we believe because of capture of those organizations, whereas violence is decreasing participation in organizations. On, or other work that we're doing with Anna Arjona and with Patricia, where we try to be very, really measure at the microeconomic level what does conflict imply, has a lot of consequences on the decisions that people make, in, not necessarily in anticipation of violence. It's also a response, a strategic response, to the behavior of armed groups that make them behave in a certain way. So I would say it's not only anticipation of violence, but something much more complex. Yeah. I have an example, perhaps, of um, work that I've done um, for our colleagues at the World Bank, and I think they're here in the room, Lucia and Diana, um, where we did a small case study um, of displaced people in Darfur, and we found that the girls who were displaced by the conflict, but who arrived in the displacement camp um, in a safe area as young girls, had a chance at catching up at the education, which they wouldn't have had back home in rural areas if they hadn't been displaced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so. You know, I hesitate to speak about the positive impact of forced displacement, but there are certainly um, some benefits associated with it which we didn't anticipate, but they then later have a completely different trajectory in the sense of the way maybe Philip outlined, yeah? But that was uh, very encouraging to find, so. And just to maybe, if I can continue to Please? that. Uh, what I didn't expect, because maybe I, I wasn't aware of, of maybe some sociology literature was the, the potential positive aspects of, of, a, of a war, namely the increase of in-group cohesion. If you go through a dreadful experience, um, it's an empirical question, what's going to happen with your local community after the war? Is everybody going to be everybody's enemy, or it's going to be a lot of solidarity and, and in-group cohesion? And it turns out we find evidence in many countries that indeed a few years after the war, these communities are more cohesive. They are more, there's more solidarity uh, in the community um, a few years after the war. And of course, that depends on the nature of the conflict, on the length of the conflict, on the, how long after the conflict you are measuring these cohesions. But at least that's something that I didn't expect. Uh, it's an open, it's an empirical question of what are the long-term effects of conflict. At least there seems to be some indication there are positive pro-social outcomes, at least at the in-group level, not necessarily at the out-group level, uh, for communities who went through the dread dreadful experience uh, of war. There is also all this recent literature on the war as a great leveler, uh, the PKT argument about uh, war increasing equality by destroying wealth. Um, the, you know, as you mentioned, the historical sociology argument still is another war as, as a factor of uh, increasing um, nation building. What we're seeing in Ukraine, for example, is the formation of very strong national identity. Uh, and of course, there is all the, the work by um, American historians and political scientists, David Mayhew, for example, who uh, argued and, and provided evidence that um, all the progressive reforms, the most important progressive reforms in the United States were the results of major wars. So would that, you know, to go back to a point about policy relevance, should we advise policymakers to make war in order to achieve progress? <laughs> what would you say, <laughs> given the evidence? And, you know, the, uh, we should be producing evidence-based policy. Well, maybe staying with the evidence-based policy. Um, Tony, you have been sort of, um, you know, going in and out of UN meetings for the last, uh, what, 20 years or so? Yeah. yeah? yeah. So where, where does this work get traction in your view? You know, how... How has, or if at all, you know, um, this is maybe um, the moment to reflect it critically, yeah? Um, what part of this agenda actually has a policy relevance as opposed to just us finding it interesting and counterintuitive? Well, I, I think it has immense policy relevance in the sense that, you know, when you're designing a, a reconstruction program or a war transition program in country, you know, you, you, you get ideas from, say, a group of people like this, and you get, you get 100 ideas at least, or 1,000 ideas, yeah? 
because there's just so much to be done, you know. Child's, children's education, rehabilitation, planting of crops, you know, resettlement of IDPs, resettlement of refugees, it would go on and on and on. Uh, and to a degree, you know, the suggestions that come forward and the ideas uh, will reflect uh, lobbying, sometimes by quite well-sourced, well-funded groups, which is desirable, you know, everybody's in the conversation there. But, you know, you can, you can then end up with a sort of program that, you know, like has 500 great things you want to do for the poor. And then you look at the resources you've got, and you can maybe do 20 of those at, at well. So, you know, the, the tendency then is you just sort of spread them around, blah, you know, and, you know, there's a great danger you won't actually achieve much at all. But, but there's also a danger in the sense politically that if you're not concentrating on the really top issue, so, for example, in terms of um, reconstruction from conflict in Africa, the role of land, access to good quality land in allowing um, households to plant and then, you know, to secure their own food security but also then to, to grow their house, household economy post-war. That's absolutely paramount, right? So, you know, it, it's very hard to argue against everything else, you know, for that, for that big priority. I mean, this was, was a discussion we had in Mozambique. And the trouble is, politically, the nefarious political actors, the actors that are just interested in grabbing what they want for themselves, have a very simple agenda. <laughs> They're going to maneuver through the system. So in some ways, you know, this kind of great splodge of objectives and, you know, fine statements by the UN, the World Bank, and everybody else kind of assist them in doing that because you don't hit the one issue that you should be hitting, for example, access to land, uh, you know, uh, imperfect tenure, uh, making sure the land, uh, the land laws protect the poor, environmental access to assets, and so forth. So I think that's, that's something we've learned in the international system. I don't see that, say that's easy, but, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, from what I've observed on country operations. I think at the sort of higher level of the UN, the sort of New York level, and I say this because I'm not in the UN anymore, is, is, is kind of, you know, the UN particularly has a terrible tendency to, to want to say, we're going to achieve all objectives with, with one instrument. You know, we're going to get peace, security, environmental security, you, you name it, water access from, from one simple kind of instrument. Sometimes as economists we've done this, you know, we're saying, you know, if we just solve inequality, we'll solve everything else. If we just solve the problem of growth, we'll solve it, you know, blah, blah. So it's what I call the kind of one-armed bandit theory of development or conflict, you know, that, you know, you, you go up to a slot machine and you just pull the, pull the slot, be it growth or inequality or whatever you're talking about, and all the, all the money comes out, you know, <laughs> all the good things arrive all at once. And, and you know, it, it just doesn't work like that. Um, so, you know, I kind of think, you know, well, in the international system, we should kind of take on more of that nuance. But that's where the research side comes in. That's where the research says, actually, guys, there's a real tension between your objectives. You should go for these 10. We think they'd be the most effective. We've talked to the communities, our anthropologists, our household surveys. They have the highest returns. You can argue against those for political reasons. It might be very good political reasons for peace, while you, know, while you go for a second best reconstruction strategy. But then at least when you've got the data and the evidence and all the analysis on the table, then you, you can have a constructive discussion. Without the data and the analysis on the table, you can just make up the facts. You know, I made up the fact about poverty in Mozambique 32 years ago, trying to be helpful, but equally, if you're a bad actor, you can make up a fact you know, that really isn't constructive for peace. So I think that's where, you know, we, we play a role. It's an important role. Just one correction on the one-armed bandit. In one out of a thousand cases, actually, a lot of money does come out, yeah? Yeah. So you just need a sample of a thousand one-armed bandits, and then you'd like to have a success story, yeah? So that's, uh, I think, the political yeah. economy of it, yeah? That... But, you know, that's also a problem. I mean, right through development economics, you know, we always have these discussions about, just get the industrial policy right, or we, if we have this project, it'd be great. And I, I always say to that, well, yeah, okay, that's fine. But we, you know, we have all the microeconomic evidence on the returns to education, returns to health, primary health care. Why don't we just spend the money on it? You know, because we have a very low risk probably of failure. 
so, you know, some people who work on, or my colleagues who work on health and education say, it's pretty naive, Tony, but I've seen so many rotten agricultural and industrial projects that I think, mm -hmm. oh, we've got a fairly high probability of success if we just spend money on, you know, rural female education. And Ana Maria? Yes, I, I was thinking while, while hearing you, Tony, that it's also very important that we as researchers and especially economists to be a little bit critical of ourselves, no? Because we tend always to try to say that evidence-based policy is very important and that we provide evidence for that. And each time we are becoming more narrow, we are becoming almost like doctors, no? Where we say, you have to do this intervention, we do a random control trial, and then we show that this uh, improved, uh, I don't know, increased education. Uh, and then we have a lot, a host of very small interventions where we have strong evidence, but somehow we are forgetting the context of each country when we are doing those interventions, where we are doing the random control trial. And we are also uh, forgetting the dynamics and the political dynamics of the society and of the different community groups. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of that, that where the context and the politics and what's happening and the tensions within the community that's really going to determine once you really scale up the project and once you are distributing funds for that and doing because you are favoring some people or not the other. So uh, that's where I think, you, you ask a question about research silos, that's where I think we economists and political scientists can work together to understand a little bit better what we're doing. And talking too much about evidence-based policy somehow gives me like, okay, but we are forgetting that societies go through political processes and need to go through democratic processes and decisions are not so straightforward as we think uh, they are. So I think that's also very important that uh, that's a self-reflection of, of what I have done during the years, but I think it's very important. Is that particularly important in the either conflict-affected or post-conflict settings? Is that <laughs> the point? Or like bringing it back to our yes. household and conflict network lessons? Is that a... I was thinking, uh, and, and also being critical of myself, for example, of what happened in Colombia during post-conflict times. So we signed the peace agreement. We had a lot of information. We had done a lot of research, economists and political scientists showing what was important about peace, why we should have peace. And what derailed peace was not that we didn't have that evidence base, and that we, it was not that we had disseminated it, but it was there were a lot of political tensions that we were not taking into account when we were doing those analyses. Mm -hmm. uh, so that made me very critical of, okay. of what we do sometimes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. There's one more topic I'd like to address you on the panel before we open up to the audience, and that's sort of like, going back to our roles as researchers and looking at the field and, you know, not necessarily the next 20 years, but where are we heading? Philip, do you have a sense? I mean, you know, we need to study the inequalities, fine. Okay, message heard, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you're doing that, others are doing that, that's good. So what's the next uh, step or the next uh, topic that we should uh, pay careful attention to in this Households and Conflict Network research area? Well, I, I think it has to do also with uh, the stage where you are in, in, in your career as a researcher, right? Um, if you are a, a graduate student, you work on your dissertation, you're, you want to make a good contribution in the literature, you have to come up with something innovative. Yeah? And, and so partly of, of what I learned in, in the workshops we have been doing uh, annually is, uh, wow, there are innovative methods that I didn't know uh, existed yeah, uh, or that I did not use when I was working on my dissertation or that are newly developed. And I think that's great that young aspiring researchers take the risk of doing that for their dissertations. Mm -hmm. At our stage, yeah, we are a little bit 20 years older, I think we should do more policy advice right, because we are, have 20 years of research experience behind us. I think for us, it's maybe okay, we can also do develop these new uh, innovative methods, but I think at our stage, and Anna Maria is a good example of this, going from academia to, to policy, is really also our task, is to talk to governments, to talk to international organizations, what do we think that research can contribute to, to policy making? And I'm, I'm not really doing really innovative research at the moment, but I'm supporting graduate students who come up with some new method or some new idea, and I try to guide them through the process. And I think that's also a contribution of, of a researcher or a professor at, at this uh, stage in their career. And I think what will happen in the next 10, 15 years is being developed by graduate students right now rather than by a, a professor like me. 
Uh, sounds maybe strange because I would be, should be uh, at the height of my career, be very innovative at the moment, but I have so much other things to do that I maybe I lack time to, to be really creative and innovative as I was maybe 15 years ago. Yeah. That's okay. an honest answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let me just ask each of you. Anna Maria, do you have a, something to add? Or? No, I think uh, Philip's uh, uh, advice is, is quite wise. I do believe it's very difficult to say uh, besides what we have been talking about, which other topics that we should concentrate on. I, I do believe that researchers need, uh, it's kind of a decentralized process, no? where the research of the important topics start to emerge and there is not this visionary who's saying, look, now we have to go this way or this way. Uh, I do believe that uh, the young people and the young researchers do come up with so innovative things and so interesting things like the workshop that we went uh, on, on Thursday and Friday that let them let them do it. And we enjoy okay. what, what everything is doing. Okay, we go into politics, right, Status? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's very difficult to disagree with uh, everything that has been uh, said before. I, I would add that, um, you know, along with the, the, um, uh, the challenge and, and the excitement uh, uh, of, of new methods is the danger of, um, ev you know, every new method being a new fad. Uh, of believing that uh, there is a silver bullet that is going for the first time to give us the entire truth, the ability to shape everything, um, we tend to forget uh, that we are, you know, in the social sciences, uh, unlike the hard sciences, we are in a sense studying ourselves, we are part of what we study, people are strategic, even if we have a successful intervention, it's going to produce winners and losers, which is called politics, and then the losers are going to find ways uh, to work against some of the you know, positive effects, change the dynamics, produce unintended effects. So uh, we are facing in a, in a hard frontier in which um, you know, even the best innovations do not seem to be producing the sort of definitive uh, predictions and laws that uh, we have in other sciences. And, so that, you know, we have to keep that in mind. And uh, if we keep that in mind productively, I think uh, that um, can produce some humility, not necessarily believing that every new development is going to open up all doors, will be successful where, you know, previous people have not. And at the same time, it's an opportunity. Uh, as I said before, um, when you lack certain things, you are forced to develop different types of creativity, uh, different types of expertise, uh, which I think are necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that, uh, for example, to go back to Philip's point, uh, something that has been denigrated a lot in political science, the idea of area studies or area expertise, um, because today you go, say, uh, in Kenya, and tomorrow in Thailand, and the day after in, in Timor, but at the same time there is value uh, to really becoming an expert in, in a specific place or um, a region, understanding, knowing the languages, having a deeper um, uh, familiarity with a particular place. Th unfortunately, these things are not necessarily always parallel to professional incentives. Mm -hmm. So professional incentives academically tend to uh, favor um, innovation at the uh, expense of, of those other skills. And also I would say at the policy realm, there is a tendency and a tension. Uh, policymakers want silver bullets. They want solutions that are going to be fast, visible, effective, which then lead people to offer them what they demand. And when that fails, of course, uh, nobody's there to pick up uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the cost. Uh, I don't think we've had um, a discussion about Afghanistan which to my mind is probably the most resounding uh, policy failure uh, of our times, uh, is a case in which enormous resources were invested. Um, you know, there were all kinds of innovative methods used to uh, introduce and test policy interventions that eventually didn't produce what they were supposed to be producing. And I, I don't hear a discussion about that. Thank you, Status. Tony, do you have a final thought before we opt for Q&A? Well, I, I think in terms of you know, new research in, initiatives and topics, um, I, I'm currently working on oil, gas, and mining uh, resource flows. And so I'm particularly fascinated in, in basically the high-income um, households or clans or families that control those assets 
and in many ways they control those assets because they've captured the state. And it's a feature of capture, state capture, sometimes following conflict, that they got what they wanted. You know, they got control of the, the asset, the natural resource, the oil, the gas, or the mineral resource. And they're quite happy then to have peace because they turn themselves from a, a roving into a stationary bandit, basically. Um, but these are transnational networks now, you know, facilitated very much by the advanced world, uh, by the bankers and the lawyers and the public relations people, operating in very, very sophisticated ways. And to a degree, the work we've been doing, this is a project we have at WIDA on, um, on uh, illicit financial flows, but also on the extractive industries, is looking, for example, at the use of the Paradise Papers data around tax havens and so forth. Because, you know, high-level corruption, particularly high-level corruption at the state level, or just simply theft, um, you know, is a very, very good indicator of a society that's, well, certainly not going anywhere developmentally, but has also probably got a very high probability of conflict. I mean, it's, it's very hard to research, but, you know, you see, a, and it's not just, you know, academics, you see a lot of very creative investigative journalists now working on this stuff. And, of course, the situation with Russia and Ukraine, you know, is, is kind of dug out all kinds of things from the woodwork. But it's not just Russia and Ukrainian oligarchs. It's, you know, Nigerian, Angolan, you know, whatever oligarchs. It's the same issues. And, yeah. and you have a sort of feedback loop because you have structures of facilitation. Yeah. Uh, armies of lawyers, investment bankers. Yeah. Allow those things. And, and it's also important to understand this because, you know, you take the instruments we have, for example, the... Foreign Corruption Practices Act of the United States, right? You know, very serious fines have now been issued under that. You know, commodity traders have been fined $200, $300 million. But it doesn't really matter. They just carry on. You know, the corruption from their side finds a home. Um, so in terms of, you know, the actual sort of policy, you know, how to attack the problem, we really need to kind of know more about the structure of incentives, what constitutes a punishment for some of these guys. Yeah, those are good economics questions again. Yeah, yeah. I, um, And maybe that's part of what I think Satchi said earlier, also, how do we go back up to the macro, right? So maybe that's also part of that agenda. Yeah, how do we, now, now that we've documented, in a sense, the human suffering and, and the causal mechanisms behind it, you know, how do we aggregate that back up and, and to the weak institutions at the top level, not just the weak institutions at the bottom or at the local level, yeah? So that's interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to um, open the floor um, for questions. Um, maybe we can collect three in a go, and then we see where the panel wants to respond. And very briefly, the ground rules. If you can briefly introduce yourself um, and, and be relatively concise in your question, please. That allows us to have lots of responses. We start with Anke on my right, and then uh, I stay on the right just now, uh, further back, and then all the way at the back. And then we do another round after that, Jill. Yeah. So, can you just raise your hands again to the other two? Yeah, if you just check the next person there with a the mask and yeah, okay, thank you, Anke. Um, Anke Höfler, University of Constance. Uh, happy birthday, um, Household and Conflict Network. I've been a consumer uh, rather than a sort of close collaborator on it um, because as you know, I'm much more known for my cross country work. So, um, I would like to suggest a little bit of a research area and would love to hear what, what you think. So with the SDGs, we've got some um, complementary goals. So for example, if we've got less poverty, we've got less conflict, and if we've got less conflict, we've got less poverty. But there are also um, SDGs that are in a direct opposition or this is how I see it, maybe you see it differently. So for example, with um, having a more sustainable global economy, um, we will have more battery technology and we need to mine more rare earths. And these rare earths are um, mined in areas um, where there's a lot of uh, conflict or it sort of exacerbates the conflict. And so connecting the micro with the macro here, um, these, um, how do we sort of um, make sure that the greening of the global economy isn't going to sort of exacerbate local conflicts? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And a second question, please. Hi, uh, my name is Grazia Pacillo from uh, CGR, uh, Focus Climate Security. Um, I, I was wondering, um, 
whether you have um, um, but well, looking at the HSCN, I uh, was wondering whether climate has been one of the factors that has been covered enough in the, these 20 years of studies. So if not, whether the intersection between climate, socioeconomic risks, risks that are drivers of conflict and conflict themselves, whether this could be also the, the next research area that you think will be valuable investing in our time. And then I have a second question directed to, to, directly to Anna Maria. Um, in your uh, research on migration and conflict, um, at least from the presentation, I mean, it seems like we've focused uh, mostly on the direction uh, from conflict to migration. But what is the evidence also on the, 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 the reverse uh, connection, the reverse nexus? So the, the, the impact of forced migration on conflict in the places of destination and, and how is this uh, connection, this nexus also affected by climate? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And a third yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm um, Rose Fonte from the World Bank. So I want to come back on the conflict-related uh, measurement issues. Uh, what do you think about constructing an index which uh, do not uh, only capture the violence, but uh, let's say a bit of all conflict-related events? Do you think that the index will increase the measurement bias or reduce it? Thank you. Did you hear that question? Not really. We didn't hear you very well, unfortunately. Something with the microphone. Could you just post it, say it again, please? About an index, but... <laughs> okay, can you hear me better? Yes. Yeah, okay, I was asking about the conflict-related measures. So, what do you think if we construct an index which do not, does not only capture the violence, but all conflict-related events, so violence, crime, attacks, destruction of building. Do you think that the index will increase the measurement bias or reduce it? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we caught it now. Uh, Philip, would you like yes, to start? I, <coughs> sorry, I can start with uh, the, the last two questions. So the, but in, in, index, it's, in an index, it's always the question, uh, what element of the index is, is driving the effect? And when we're going to put uh, um, violence uh, from, from, let's say, from rebels or from armies together with ordinary crime, together with uh, drug-related crime and things like that, we're going to make a, a potpourri out of it, and we're not going to know exactly what's going to drive the effect. So I always be in favor of always singling out the type of violence that we are studying. And at some of our conference, we had had... Uh, papers on crime. And so we are not exclusively working on violent conflict, but we are also open, for example, to the effect of Mexican violence caused by drug-related crime. And so definitely we are interested in studying that, but I wouldn't make an index, I think, where I put all kinds of violence uh, together to see what then the aggregate effect is of the level of you know, aggregate violence uh, in the country. I don't think that makes uh, much sense. And on, on the climate question, if I, if I may, uh, yeah. so the, the network really works bottom up. Uh, so we look at what is of interest to the people we are working with and we leave a lot of leeway to the local organizer of the subsequent conferences to come up with teams. And definitely climate is on our agenda and I'm sure in the next few years there will be a Hicken uh, annual workshop where we study the effect of climate and conflict of course, there are other scores already contributing to, to this literature, and we have in our working paper season a series of papers on drought-related matters, on climate, that's already there. Although, to my knowledge, it hasn't been the theme of an annual conference yet, but it does not mean that it's not on our agenda. Thank you. What I think is interesting about the climate and conflict nexus is that it's very well established that there is a nexus, or even a causal relationship from um, certain climate events to uh, conflict, violent conflict, um, but that the mechanisms are so hotly debated, yeah? And that's much less clear and, and in a sense, much more interesting because um, take the El Nino phenomenon, which is part of these science and nature papers, right? Um, you know, when it's really hot, I mean, do you really want to go out and fight? I mean, fighting is a really physically difficult activity, yeah? And you really rather stay in your barracks and drink a cold beer, yeah? So to get your commander for you to go out, work in a coordinated way, impose 
horrible sufferings on other people who are totally innocent, you know, is a terrible concept. It's, it's completely illogical why that would happen in the first place, yeah? So there must be something um, going on, uh, you know, whether it's reduced uh, crops or whether it's, you know, I mean, there's a certain, so many, I don't want to repeat it now, but I'm just saying it's, a, I think it's a great empirical puzzle, yeah? And lots of good research is being done on it, but uh, in sort of, in a sense, establishing the causality was much easier than understanding it, yeah? Anna Maria, you were also directly addressed. Okay. I will talk about climate uh, and, and conflict and climate and migration. I do believe that's a very important issue to study. Uh, in fact, you find there are many papers that show a strong relation between migration and uh, climate. But there we really don't know well what are the mechanisms that are causing that. Is, is it crop failure? Is, does it have to do something with labor markets in, the, in, in these regions? Or what else is driving migration that, the migration that is related to climate? So there is a host of things that we can study there. There is already people studying it. We finished a, just a few weeks ago a study with El, in, in El Salvador where we find that indeed uh, the, the climate caused migration through the reduction of agricultural production and through the contraction of uh, the labor demand. About how this affects conflict, this migration, I haven't seen many studies of that and I think that's very important because we will have much more migration due to climate. And this is going to reconfigure and redistribute the, the population not only inside the countries, but crossing internationally, and we do have to understand a little bit better. Are we going to talk about climate refugees? What does it entail to be a climate refugee? What's going to happen inside the countries? I think those are a lot of important questions that we need to start discussing uh, right now. Uh, and lastly, on that, I think it's very important because climate change was caused primarily, and now it's caused also by developing countries, but by developed countries, but the countries that are bearing the, br the brunt of, of the effect are developing countries that are causing this migration. So what is the global share of the responsibility of this? So there are a lot of very interesting questions that we should be start analyzing. Thank you. Any other replies or? Tony? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, Anka raises a, a fascinating question. It, go, it goes back to sort of kind of the, I wouldn't say it's a big, well, there's an issue with the SDGs, which is, again, coming back to my point that in the UN systems, there tends to believe that all good things can be achieved together. And there is a tension, particularly between the energy poverty goal and the um, uh, generalized poverty goal and the climate goals, because... In many countries, we, we do not have the renewables to achieve that. You know, if you, if you ask the president of Rwanda, what's he going to do? He's going to go for coal and gas. Uh, likewise, the, um, the president of, of Uganda, right? Because they want to reduce poverty. Uh, and that's, what, that's where we are. Um, but the, the energy transition is, is going to affect conflict in at least three ways. One of which is it's going to affect the fiscal base of the state. Uh, it's going to affect the fiscal base of the state of the oil and gas producers eventually because the oil and gas will strand. It will become commercially valueless. And the debate within the oil and gas sector is at what point that happens. At the moment, they're making out with a bonanza. You know, the gas price is a big high, but it collapsed during the pandemic. How is that going to be managed? What ramifications is that going to have for elites who have been very dependent on the control of those natural resource rents, both for their own wealth accumulation, but also for you know, mobilizing support for their political agenda in society. On the other side of the coin, you know, the rare earths you mentioned, but also the nickel, the cobalt, the lithium, all the rest of it, that's another bonanza. You know, all the projections are prices are going up, and they're going up long term. So who controls the resources? And again, you will see that's going to affect the fiscal basis of the state and therefore the politics of the state and the ability of the state to mobilize support, to actually reduce poverty through the distribution of those rents in, in, a, in a good way. And, and that's going to set off all kinds of interesting political dynamics, which some of which could be very unfavorable because, you know, we, we know the one thing that we know from resource booms is they can be handled terribly. And, and you'll work with Paul Collier you know, uh, uh, two decades ago was illustrating the, the role of natural resources in conflict. So that's the first one. The, the second one, 
uh, basically goes to the personal wealth of the elites in the way that they control these natural resources. But they're pretty smart. You know, they'll diversify. You, you're in oil and gas at the moment. You're in mining. You, you get into property. You get into financial wealth. You, you know, the smart oligarch is the diversifying oligarch. You don't sit around and wait for Vladimir Putin to come along and, you know, pinch your mine or whatever it is. So there's all, going to be all kinds of interesting dynamics there. But thirdly, there's going to be, you know, the community dynamics of mining, but also of oil and gas, are still pretty terrible. I mean, we've improved in the last 20 years in helping communities to manage the local impact of these large investments in mining and, and other resource extraction. But there are still some terrible things that go on. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's a real problem around localised conflict. You know, one reason, you know, because I work on, on these issues now, one reason why people just don't want to go anywhere near the oil, gas and mining sector as a development issue is they just see the whole thing as toxic. Toxic for climate, toxic for the environment, toxic for communities. And yet, you know, we're all sitting here with all this technology, which is running on rare earths, lithium, cobalt, and all the rest of it, and an energy system that's being supplied by whatever it is, coal, gas, etc. So, so this is a dimension of the climate and energy debate that isn't really coming out yet. But it's a major, major set of, set of issues. Because you think about the conflicts that were set off you know, 100 years ago, ultimately, by the transition from horsepower to the use of oil. You know, that then fed into these systemic factors that rolled through the 20th century. So it's not all good news. It's not all good news. Just on the point of the, 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 the broader aggregate index of conflict and violence, you know, my thought is, well, economists, you know, we, we produce GDP, which amalgamates together all kinds of things, and then we argue about, you know, should this be in it or should that be in it? So we do produce that aggregate, and it's treated very importantly. But again, I think we'd, we'd have an issue around the weighting system. It's like the Human Development Index. You know, how would we weight it? But, you know, if we got some consensus, then, yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> I always think that the happiness index is the easiest one, yeah, to aggregate it all. But, uh, OK, let's have another round of questions. Um, there's Jill, then behind Jill, and then a uh, third one from the back in this group, and then later I come back to you um, for a third round. So let's try to, uh, to do two more rounds, yeah? So concise questions, concise answers we manage. Thank you. Gilles. Yeah, Gilles, Gilles Garbonnier of the International Committee of the Red Cross and the Graduate Institute. Uh, I have one question as we celebrate almost 20 years of the Household in Conflict Network. Uh, and and uh, Philip, you mentioned investing now more on research policy transfer, research practice transfer. My question is, what has been the, the major successes in transferring uh, interesting insights to influence policy and practice? And I was particularly struck by the examples of, you know, different people of different age, gender, regions of Ukraine and how conflict actually impacts them. And what is the immediate vulnerability, but what are the long-term uh, consequences? And for me now, with the humanitarian organization, of course, this should inform uh, the way we go about, uh, you know, assisting supported livelihood uh, protection programs, uh, both uh, by being sometimes more systemic, so going, for instance, in Ukraine to support massively the Ministry of, uh, of Social uh, Policy and Social Protection programs, strengthening this, but also outside of this program, how much directly should we intervene to, to, to really uh, look after sp very specific uh, categories of, of people. And uh, I, I'm very intrigued about, you know, how much su success you got. And maybe a very small but tricky question for Statis. I was uh, really appreciating the fact that you said it's important to look also at systemic shifts uh, from the Cold War to the liberal peace to new form of revolutionary thinking leading to protracted conflicts. And if I can push you a bit on seeing today, whether we are yet at another critical juncture of systemic shifts towards maybe the return of big power politics, or if this is just another layers adding to other layers which makes things too complex, maybe a bit what uh, we discussed with so many different variables that uh, you know, it becomes extremely difficult to do appropriate foresight for planning. Can you just pass it to the back? Maybe. Yep. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Hélène Joufelkit. I am from the French Development Agency. Uh, thank you for showing all the piece of work that has been put together. It's really impressive huh, during these 20 years and uh, happy birthday. Uh, I had a question that beyond the research production, uh, did you have uh, any ambition of constructing capacities of uh, local researchers, strengthening capacity of data producers during, within this network? And uh, could you uh, eventually uh, tell a word of the achievement in this endeavor? Thank you. Thank you very much. And then there was a third question. You have a mic? Okay. Thank you very much of these interesting presentations. My name is Irmeli Mustalahti and I'm working with the University of Eastern Finland here in, in eastern part of Finland. <laughs> and I would like to comment to this um, question about the climate migration, climate refugees, because it's actually discussed quite a lot of in political sciences and youth research. And um, it's actually the term which is we need to be quite careful. Like what is actually the reasons why, for example, young people from western part of Africa is leaving now? As the sciences also quite easily use this term a climate migration at climate refugees, when it actually the researchers who have been working especially in the uh, Western Africa, they have recognized that the reasons are very multifaced and, and it's not only the climate but also what is happening with the democratic uh, institutions there, what is actually the youth possibilities to participate the various actions, various uh, democratic institutions? Is there the room for the uh, youth participation? So, unfortunately, once we use the certain terms, we actually make the world too simplistic. And, and, and this is something what also concerns me, that once we talk about it, there were also uh, these questions related to natural resources and, and crimes, uh, that actually these crimes are not necessarily recognized as the crimes in internationally. And there is not resolutions how, to, how these crimes could be taken to, for example, international court. Okay, thank you very much. I think these three questions addressed uh each of you in some way, so maybe you can have a short answer each, and then we have the final round, yeah? Um, let's do the same order as before, yeah, okay. Philip? Well, for, for the first question, it's not easy for a researcher to trace the impact of her or his work, yeah? So once your paper is out, and it's open for the public, and, and basically uh, many researchers believe that their role is, uh, is, is stopped, yeah? Uh, then you can advocate in a policy-making community to read it and what are the policy implications and so forth. But that's not easy eh? because it's up to the policy-making community to, let's say, read your work or at least a, 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 an abstract of it or a two-page summary of it and then see if there's something useful for it. Yeah? So once you see an evolution in, in a large donors' uh, way they do uh, policy, it's also very difficult to say this is due because of my paper. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It's usually an evolution that has many fathers and mothers. But at one point, I've, I've written a paper to, together with Jean-Francois Maistat on the importance of hosts uh, who are accepting refugees in their community. Yeah? And I remember that the UNHCR about 20 years ago were only looking at refugees. Uh, that was their main mandate. What happens to the refugees? Do they have shelter? Do they have food? And at the conference after that paper, somebody told me, well, now we're also looking at the hosts. And of course, that's not the result of my paper, but we, 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 we really told the UNHCR that you shouldn't focus only on the refugees, but also on the host community, who might be envious that the refugees get access to jobs, they get access to sanitary conditions, they get access to health, and the hosts in the same community don't get any access, whereas they're taking all the space there. And the new policy of UNHCR since a few years is to integrate services for refugees who are forcibly displaced, as well as the host population in those areas something that we advocated in, in, in that paper. Uh, and so that could, is that an outcome of one's work? I, I don't know. But it is like 
policy evolution goes that way, and as researchers, or as a community of researchers, we contribute and we try to convince uh, large donors to go in that direction, and then they have influences from many, many uh, uh, directions, and the researchers is one of those influences, yeah? Maybe if I can just, oh, sorry, I didn't want to stop you. No, but no, I had this if, a second yeah. question. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, uh, yeah, but maybe just on that point, yeah. um, sometimes I think it's just pushing um, a perspective rather than a finding. I think that's maybe our more important contribution, yeah, and getting people to think of a certain angle or certain view or the, you know, rather than saying what specifically needs to be done. That's my view of how academic research can be very influential. But yeah, you had a brief point on the second. Yes, on yeah. the capacity building, we had a few years ago, we had um, a very interesting project where we were asked by the World Bank uh, to train um, statisticians working on National Institute of Statistics um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in, in the Middle East and in Asia. And this effort was, was led by, by Tillman, where we were one week, uh, three times one week, with 20, 30 uh, statisticians from one of each country, where we uh, trained them in how to include questions on exposure to violence in the work that they were already doing. And so that was, uh, that was uh, I think, remarkable that they were open to that, because National Institute of Statistics usually not interested in questions on exposure to violence, but we worked with them and they, 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 they said it's possible to introduce that in the, in the work they were doing. And we did that for African scholars, sorry, statisticians, people in the Middle East, and um, in Asia, and I think, uh, Tillman, of course, you, you know more about it, but this was really great to be able to do that, and for me, that is a task of, of scholars like us, is to do capacity building, at least for part of, of our time, next, of course, to the graduate students we have, but also to scholars in the Global South. Thank you, Philip. Anna Maria? Yes, uh, on the capacity of local researchers, I would, uh, I would like to la add something on, on the Households in Conflict Network. I was uh, a researcher based in Colombia and working at the uh, Colombian University for the last years I haven't been. But for me, uh, being able to present my work, come uh, to the different, for example, workshops of Hikin and know people from other countries, has, was very important because my, my job was showcased, but also because I was able to, to establish networks and work on a lot of projects that we have been working together, for example, with Patricia and with other researchers. Uh, so this allows us uh, in a developing country to really strengthen our capacity in, in a more informal way that I think it's also very important. About climate migration, I agree fully with you. It's a much more complex process. In fact, when you ask migrants why they migrated, they would never say it. it's because of the climate. It's because I was hungry, it's because I lacked food, or it's because there was crop failure. However, I do believe that we need to go into that discussion because um, climate is causing migration and is causing a lot of negative impacts that are going to affect developing and developed countries, and it's going to have redistributional consequences. And I think the discussion is important because how do we address that? What is the, going to be the responsibility of developed countries? What is going to be the, re, the responsibility of the developing countries? How do are we are the developing countries are going to receive support to that process? So, although I agree completely with you that you cannot be simplistic, uh, we need to have that discussion. Thank you. That is. Yeah, on the question of systemic change, um, it's always tempting to say that. Um, whatever new and big happens is going to change everything uh, in a sort of radical way. Um, I still remember how people predicted the pandemic was going to be completely game-changing in everything. It has been in some respects, but not in others. And it has been completely the opposite um, as well um, in some other respects. Um, and even for September 11, which I think in, in, the, in retrospect turns out to have been quite consequential, it was consequential primarily through the channel of the U.S. response to it rather than uh, the, uh, the attack itself, uh, and also in a sort of complicated way. It's, so it's impossible to say how what is happening now uh, uh, is going to change things. Some people, for example, very quickly have jumped on the idea that we're going to go to a new Cold War. Uh, we don't know whether that's going to be the case. One of the difficulties, um, and I, perhaps that's an example to illustrate the point, is that when we do research, the same concept uh, is sometimes uh, consistent with one thing and exactly its opposite, which makes this type of predictions very difficult. I'll give you the example 
which is we think of nationalism as an ideology that is primarily associated with violent conflict through uh, aggressive wars, through secessionist wars, for example. Uh, but it's also the case, and we forget it, and I think the events in Ukraine illustrate it, that nationalism has been also associated with the um, prevention of war. The reason, one of the factors that we've had a very important uh, decline of interstate wars uh, is the fact that you cannot really absorb a population uh, into your country because they have a different national identity from you. And it is the ignorance of that fact by Russia that has led, in a sense, to the war, the idea that uh, the Ukrainians wouldn't resist the way they haven't, that uh, uh, is illustrating, perhaps, you know, how these things work uh, in ways that are, you know, difficult to... Uh, to predict and precisely before the, uh, the conflict began, uh, I believe that uh, the Russians were not going to invade precisely because of that factor. Now, the fact that they ignored it uh, is, isn't necessarily a falsification of that, uh, but perhaps the outlier eventually that confirms that indeed nationalism has the property of preventing war as well. So I'm not going to make any prediction about the long-term effects of what is happening. It can go in any direction. Uh, what I'm going to say is that people who make very strong predictions mm -hmm. are probably uh, shouldn't be listened to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good policy advice. <laughs> Tony. I'd, I'd just like to pick up on, um, I think it was Illa's point from the University of Eastern Finland about um, uh, a lot of crimes are not being prosecuted or not recognized as crimes. And, there's, there's an interesting issue here now. For example, if you think, you, you take the diamond trade. You know, we, we know that the, the diamonds are often flowing down from artisanal miners through uh, complex uh, systems of criminal networks and conflict networks. So there's an analysis at the household level of the artisanal miners and, you know, how they're driven to that by poverty. But there's also an issue around the industrial organization, a very complex supply chains that move the diamonds, for example, from uh, the Sahel uh, through to the Gulf countries where they're finally sold and, and so forth. And, you know, the, that chain, we, we have, you know, efforts to try and, you know, organize uh, responsible chains in commodities. The Kimberley process and so forth has made some dent in it, but we still have this going on. But there's an interesting dynamic here, and it now connects to the, the point we were just discussing earlier about bold predictions, which, which is that if I was to make a, make a bold prediction, um, in the case of, of case of Russia, again, if you take diamonds, but also gold, uh, Russia is a very big producer, probably about a third of the gold market, a third of the diamond market overall. The, 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 the process by which now those diamonds and that gold are going to move international centers for sale and onward transmission is attracting a lot of attention, uh, including possibly the use of secondary sanctions on um, merchants in the Gulf and so forth. So whereas the artisanal mining conflict issue in Africa has not attracted enough policy attention, the case law or the uh, actions that are taken in the case of Russia on the sanctions of income from not only mining but oil and gas possibly will set up a set of case laws which can then be used in the prosecutions of people involved in other conflicts or other illegal criminal activity, particularly in the African case. So if I've got a prediction, a bold prediction, it would be that we might actually see progress on that from the current situation that we are with Ukraine and, and Russia. But maybe I'm wrong. Anyway. Stantis thinks you're wrong because it's a bold no, no, no. prediction. But <laughs> let's have one or two uh, lower, right? last. Yeah. Uh, no? OK. Um, is that Anastasia behind the mask? Yes. And then at the back, two quick questions. But please be brief each. And then with a final round of answers. And then we finish in a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a great discussion. Anastasia Shesterina, Center for the Comparative Study of Civil War, the University of Sheffield. I have a very simple question. What, in your view, are some of the most important questions that we should be asking going forward? Okay, thank you. 
from the UK's Foreign Commonwealth Development Office. A question for Anna Maria. So I was interested in the finding you talked about on reduction in wages of our workers in recipient countries receiving migrants fleeing from conflict, which conflicts or, or, or is different from the finding of um, international migrants going to advanced economies where we see benign or even pos positive impacts, not that you could get our politicians to admit it. But um, could, you, could I attempt you to speculate on, on what's driving that difference and if there's anything that policymakers could do to turn the, the, the conflict migration situation to look more like the um, international migra migration situation? Thank you very much. And then one more behind you. Thank you. I'm Paivi Kannista from UN Women, and uh, I wanted to suggest two areas to further research, especially based on Tony's comments in the, in the panel. Um, and you mentioned Darfur also in this discussion. So both in Darfur and also in uh, ISIS-occupied areas of Iraq, huge areas of land were cleared by armed groups, also especially by using sexual violence against women and girls. And this land was uh, cleared, overtaken by the armed groups. And uh, there is evidence they were also used uh, for financing the activities of these armed groups, so like extremist activities afterwards. So, are we so focused on looking at refugees and humanitarian catastrophes ensuing that we are not looking at what is happening in the areas that are left behind by the refugees? And then the other, other research area in, linked into this is there are still from two of, these, two of these areas which were mentioned, there are at least a million refugees still, million displaced million, over million uh, displaced people. They are never going to get their land and assets back, are they? Who is looking at, you know, what are the, what's the situation of people who used to own the land and assets and it was taken away, overtaken by armed groups and they are not getting it back. So I think that situation, I haven't heard anyone addressing it anywhere really. Uh, in a bigger scale. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just very briefly, um, pick one <laughs> mm -hmm. question and answer it in 30 seconds, Philip. Well, uh, I'm going to look in my crystal ball. No, I, I don't have one. No, one question that has been on for several years and which in the, in the Households in Conflict Network we have not been able to address fully is the relationship between the macro and, and the micro level. And so we know policies are, are made at, at the macro level, but how do they influence choices at the micro level? And to give an example, if, for example, as a researcher you believe inequality is, is very important and you find some evidence about that, I challenge you to find out the real motivation of a poor person who is frustrated by the inequality in a country to find out if that's the real motivation to, for example, uh, join a rebel group. And making that, uh, that click, making that, um, that link from the macro to the micro level is extremely difficult. And I think that could be a, an, an interesting future agenda. How do young people in, um, in conflict-affected countries regard at the macro level, at the policy makers, and how are they feeling uh, influenced in their own decision making um, at the micro level, at the individual and the household level to make their choices. And I think that's a challenging question. We have not fully, we tried a few times, but we haven't fully addressed that, and I would like to see more work on that. Thank you, Philip. Anna Maria? Thank you, Tillman. Um, no, I, I'm going to answer the question about the reduction of, of wages with the internally displaced population. I have two hypotheses, but I really think that that need to be really mm, thought out well. The first one is the country is in conflict, so labor markets in the whole country are weak, and all the country is facing the economic impacts of conflict. So you have people moving around the country, and they arrive to urban areas, but their urban areas anyways are not so dynamic to absorb to absorb the population and not have a reduction in wages. So you see this very large reduction in wages and the second reason is because you have very large informal markets that are extremely sensitive and they can move. They don't have these, these uh, 
floor that is the minimum wage because these are unregulated markets. So that's why wages fall so significantly. Um, and I think that's important. Another important thing that has not been studied is what happens in the areas where the, 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 the displaced population came from. So the, where all these massive flows of people went out, something must have happened with the labor markets there, and I haven't seen any studies on that. Okay, thank you very much. Anna Maria, starters, do you have a... Well, I should take the, uh, the question about uh, the most important question that is not asked. <laughs> yes. uh, and I would say my favorite one um, is that, you know, if you think about uh, how many countries are extremely poor, uh, how much inequality exists, how much ethnic tension and antagonism, uh, how, much, how many corrupt politicians are around, you know, it's really puzzling uh, that there is no more, you know, conflict happening around us. And in fact, the puzzle of peace is exactly that. There is a lot of peace, much more than one would expect based on the kinds of things uh, we think are associated with conflict. And if that's the case, then it means that perhaps, you know, conflict, the conflict we see is just noise. And the really, you know, important questions we should be asking uh, are the questions about the resilience uh, of um, human behavior and institutions, which despite all these things that are so challenging, uh, prevent conflict from happening, actually. Thank you, Status. And Tony? Um, on, the, on the research issues, I, I think, you know, as I said before, the transnational networks of wealthy families and clans uh, and how they not only operate through criminal syndicates, but also engage in state capture and how they manage their wealth. Because, you know, I think that's terribly important for policy. How are we going to get at that issue? Is it legal? Is it the, you know, the corruption acts? Is it, you know, what are we going to do about that? Because we don't quite have the instruments. But also actually just picking up on Pivey's problem, uh, point about, um, uh, you know, the sexual violence and, and so forth. We tend to kind of confine some of these things into silos. So some people are studying trafficked women, for example, into prostitution and so forth. Some are studying narcotics. Some are just studying diamonds and so forth. But from the, the perspective of organized crime, it's a, it's a portfolio. And one thing can, you know, leverage you into another. So if you, if you have the artisanal diamond revenue, you can then go into trafficking women to Europe. You can, you can engage in the narcotics or drugs trade. Uh, you can steal stuff as an asset, collateral for further, further crime. So I think, you know, um, because there are separate agencies working on these issues, they can drop into silos where they're very much interconnected. All right. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Status. Thank you, Anna Maria. Thank you, Philip. And thank you for your questions and for staying on so long until uh, 6 p.m. And this brings us to the end of day one of this um, conference, but it doesn't bring us, I think, to the end of micro-level research on conflict. And just listening to my colleagues here, I'm realizing that I'm probably just about halfway through my, you know, sort of post-PhD professional career um, if I don't go into uh, politics or policy. Um, and so I have another, I don't know, 16 to 18 years to go, um, which would bring us comfortably to... Um, another UN uh, wider um, conference on the theme um, <laughs> in the year 2000, I don't know, 40 or so. Yeah. And, and I would imagine that there are two things we would be discussing then. A, I don't think um, you know, peace will be done and, and conflict solved. Unfortunately, I, I fear that it's something that will always bubble up uh, to some extent. But, but I could imagine that we'll have a lot more disciplines uh, on the podium here, generally working together across these sort of traditional boundaries, you know, public health people, lawyers, uh, psychologist, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe engineers or, you know, natural scientists. So I think that is one way um, to go, and I think I'm very excited about that, and I look forward in the next few years to work with people from completely different backgrounds. You know, I have a lot of very good economics colleagues, but I, I really look forward to making colleagues in, in other fields. And the other thing is I'm a sort of survey type of person, you know, I like measuring things, and I, it strikes me that when we start measuring something, we start studying it. But if we don't measure it, we don't study it. And I think we need to measure a lot more things in order to, you know, some of the things we discussed here with words, you know, we couldn't have discussed them with numbers. And so I think we need to, 
keep being on the alert, you know, what is it that we study? And with all this promise of big data and automated data and so on, you know, what is that measuring in turn? And so just making sure that, um, you know, we really capture peace and conflict um, properly and, and, and comprehensively in the human response to it. So I think, unfortunately, a lot remains to be done, but that's good news for us researchers. Yeah, we will still be in business then. And thank you for your patience and your attention. Thank you. Thank you.